like to very much welcome Professor Crystal Clays, who is going to speak to us um, a little bit more around another rare neurological disorder that is of huge importance to our community and some of the issues around international treatment standards and in this case we're going to be speaking specifically around myasthenia gravis. So perhaps the first question and by way of introduction you might explain to us why we need these international standards, uh, why do we need to assess them and what are the challenges when it comes to rare neurological disorders such as myasthenia gravis in, in this respect? <laughs> So indeed, uh, myasthenia gravis, which is a disease of the neuromuscular junction and which is characterized by weakness uh, of the muscles. Um, so only, well, in what, let's say 100 years ago, uh, mortality rate of myasthenia gravis was still almost 100%. Um, but in uh, the following 100 years up to now, uh, uh, 2000, um, mortality has decreased uh, less than 5%, mainly due to myasthenic crisis, uh, where there is a real exacerbation of the muscle weakness in, uh, in the patients. Um, and that is due to, uh, due to um, the development of different uh, technologies like uh, ventilation, like plasma exchange, like other uh, immunosuppressant medications. And so it's um, very important because it is a rare disease that um, we, um, um, first of all, get a good awareness of the disease, of course, uh, to recognize the disease and also to have a good treatment for the disease because this will, um, this will be important for prognosis uh, and uh, quality of life of the patients. So that's why uh, we um, are very much focusing on uh, developing uh, guidelines um, to inform everybody on what to do, how to manage and how to treat patients with this uh, rare disease. Um, and that is what I will talk about uh, later this afternoon. Uh, the guidelines have been made by um, the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America Task Force, uh, in which I was not involved myself, but the guidelines have been published in a high-impact uh, uh, journal, uh, Neurology, uh, in 2016 and have been updated uh, lately in 2020. So you touched on a very important point when it comes to guidelines for rare neurological disorders. I, I know, for example, this year the EAN is tackling uh, another uh, rare neurological disorder and, and addressing the issues with a lack of guideline there. Um, you mentioned uh, learnings from the United States when it comes to dealing with uh, rare disease populations. How important is it that there is that international collaboration and multi-stakeholder approach? It's certainly very important uh, first to start with the clinical trials uh, because of course we need a lot of patients uh, included in the clinical trials and since it's a rare disease, uh, like you have a lot of inclusion ex exclusion criteria so you need to have a, a quite homogeneous population so we need to work uh, with a lot of centers together internationally between the United States between Europe it's really very important the first point to get enough patients together to do the clinical trials with the different uh, medications and if we were to follow on then on that topic of clinical trials and, and standards for, for protocols for example and outcome measures and making sure you know we get the right outcome measures because rare disease communities wait an extremely long time to be included in the discussion and we've heard this earlier because of the the lower pre prevalence rates and then the, similarly the the lower awareness and the lower levels of funding what what can patient organizations do or what can families affected by rare neurological conditions to, to support their involvement in the design and the development of patient reported outcome measures and do you think that that is something that will evolve over time or do you think you know the reported outcome measures are already sufficient? I think there is still a lot of work to do um, on outcome measures in general but especially also in patient reported outcome measures. Um, there are some tr um, studies going on um, also here in Europe where uh, patient reported outcome measures are being studied, especially in myasthenia and also in other uh, diseases. 
So it's really very important. Of course, what could the patients do is really collaborating with us in these efforts because, of course, we need the patients to further develop these outcome measures. And on that, you have just mentioned that there are some, some clinical trials ongoing. Um, would you say that there is an element of excitement, perhaps, for the myasthenia gravis population at present? Is there any element of hope? Can you give us any insights into anything that might be coming down the pipeline that our community could perhaps anticipate in the near future or anything perhaps in the longer term? Absolutely. So there are um, quite some new medications with a new mechanism of action that are being uh, developed and that already in a quite uh, far stage uh, to be uh, commercialized. Um, that are the so-called FCRN inhibitors, uh, of which uh, some companies have uh, a product that is already uh, at the market or almost at the market and they have a completely different action of mechanism of action as we know from the other immunosuppressant uh, medications. Um, also there are C5 inhibitors, also new, um, a new way of um, treating myasthenia. Um, so I really think it's it are a very exciting times uh, for um, the development of treatments, uh, of new treatments in myasthenia. So uh, in the next few years we will hear a lot about that. Thank you. Could I ask if anyone in the audience has any questions? No? Thank you. Um, could I perhaps ask you to, to remind our audience at what time and where they can listen to your talk? Um, the session starts at 3 this afternoon, 3 till 4.30, and I'm the second speaker, so it should be 3.30 until 4. And in what location? Uh, I think it's uh, Room Vienna. Like Room this. Vienna. Yes. Thank you.